We've just gone through the infinite line of mass, and we applied Gauss's theorem to derive its gravitational field. Now let's look at the infinite cylinder of mass. Now there's a lot of overlap between the previous video and this video, so there's a few things that I'm going to go a little faster on here, but of course there are a couple differences that we need to point out along the way. So first things first, we need to discuss, or in some way represent, how the mass is being distributed in this problem. Now certainly it's an infinite cylinder, but the point is it's a cylinder, so it has a certain volume. It's an object that has mass, and so what we want to introduce is the volume mass density, also just called mass density sometimes, rho, which is mass over volume, and describes the fact that the mass is distributed over a volume here. So rho is constant, but we'll see why it's important to, to have rho in this problem. It's kind of the same argument as the infinite line. At least with rho, you can compare two infinite cylinders of mass. If one is 10 kilograms per cubic meter versus the other one is 20 kilograms per cubic meter, you can compare densities. One is twice as dense as the other. Versus comparing masses, you can't. Both cylinders are infinite, so they both have an infinite amount of mass. So we have rho. Good. Then, symmetry. Now, we did this in the infinite line of mass, too, so let's go a little quicker this time. The symmetry of the entire object lends itself well to cylindrical coordinates, where we have r, theta, and then along the axis of the cylinder z. And so we would expect that our gravitational field would be a function of r, theta, and z. However, because it's actually an infinite cylinder, you can go up and down the z direction. You're always going to see the same thing. Therefore, g should not depend on z. And if you walk around the cylinder, you should always see the same thing. There's nothing special about one side versus the other. And so there's rotational invariance. In other words, it does not make sense to have g depend on theta. So g is just a function of r, the radial distance between the axis of your cylinder and the point that you're considering. So we know that g is only a function of one variable. And of course, it's not hard to argue that, same as the infinite line of mass, g is actually going to be radial pointing toward the mass. So the gravitational field lines are going to look like this. Actually, they don't necessarily stop at the surface here. They're going to come in like that. And they're radial, so they're along the radius. And they all lie in the same plane. So all these lines here, these field lines all lie in the plane of the top of, of the cylinder. So, or, or this, well, and this horizontal slice, let's say, of the cylinder. That's a better way to put it. Same is true down here, of course. And so it's going to be really the same argument and the same radial field, at least in terms of direction, as the case of the infinite line of mass. So that means that the case that we made for a Gaussian cylinder with the infinite line of mass obviously is going to hold in the case of this distribution. And so we are going to use Gauss's theorem with a closed Gaussian cylinder. Now, here's where the difference with the infinite line of mass comes in. Your cylinder is actually a cylinder in the sense that it has a volume. So you can define a region inside the cylinder, that's where the mass is, and then a region outside the cylinder. Now I usually label them 1 and 2, and 3, 4, 5 if there's multiple. But in this case, there are two regions of space. Either you're inside the cylinder where all the mass is, either or you're outside. So those are the two options. And if you have multiple regions, you have to apply Gauss's theorem multiple times. And you do it in each region. And for each region, you find the gravitational field of that region, which has no reason to be the same, necessarily. Maybe you find out that in some cases it is, but in general, there's no reason to assume that the gravitational field in region 1 will be the same as the gravitational field in region 2. In fact, in this case, they won't. So we are going to take a Gaussian cylinder, and we're going to do region 1 first. It is typically easier to work your way from the inside out, because what you're looking at is the enclosed mass. 
So it's just easier to start small and work your way out, get bigger. And that's going to be for r, little r, less than big R. And little r is the radius of our Gaussian cylinder. So let's draw ourselves a Gaussian cylinder. Actually, that's a little big. I'm going to draw like this. It's going to have, just like we had for the infinite line of mass, an arbitrary length L. There we go. This is going to be the arbitrary length L of the cylinder. And it's going to have a radius little r. So it's getting crowded over there. But bear with me. Let's just draw it here. It'll be easier to see. Here's the above view with radius little r smaller than big R. Now, we went through this in detail with the infinite line of mass. There's going to be no flux through the top or the bottom, only through the cylindrical wall. And the reason why the cylinder is a good choice is because everywhere you look, dA2 is going to be radially outward, while G is radially inward, which means that everywhere G is going to be at 180 degrees compared to dA2. And everywhere on my Gaussian cylinder, on its surface, I will have the same gravitational field because all the points are the same distance from the center of the cylinder of mass. So I have a cylindrical wall over which g is constant in magnitude and direction. And so the flux is going to boil down to something very simple. It's just going to be g cosine theta times the area. So just to go maybe a little faster in this video than in the previous one, let's write down the flux. So the flux through the entire cylinder, which is a closed surface, is the double integral of g dot dA. And there's three parts to that. And there, because there's three parts to the cylinder, there's A1, A2, A3. So just not to skip over too many details here, let's remind ourselves that we have dA1 up top here. dA2 is for the cylindrical wall. And then dA3 is down here. And what we're doing is we're computing the integral over top, bottom, and vertical wall. Each one is not a closed surface, so there's no ring around these integrals. And we start with A1. That's going to be G, cosine of the angle between G and dA1, which is 90, times dA1. Cosine 90 is 0, so no flux to the top. Integral over A2, G cosine, well, 180, because everywhere you look, you're going to have 180 between g and dA2. And then plus the integral over A3 of g cosine of the angle between g and dA3, which is 90. And cosine of 90 is 0, so no flux to the bottom as expected. And so a flux is going to boil down to minus 1, because that's what cosine 180 is equal to. g is constant on a2, and so I'm just integrating dA2 over a2. That gives me minus g. It's actually minus g of r. That makes more sense. Times a2, which we argued is 2 pi rl. Right? A cylindrical wall with radius r and height l has a surface area 2 pi r times l. And that's my flux. I'm going to set that equal to minus 4 pi g, I'm enclosed. This is where things get a little bit more interesting. Because now we're in region 1, and we need to figure out how much mass is enclosed by our Gaussian cylinder. In other words, how much mass lives inside of this cylinder right here. And we do not account for the mass that lives outside the cylinder. Now, this is a common question that I get all the time, too, because you're confused. You're like, well, no, but the mass outside somehow has to matter. It's like, well, it does, but you've already accounted for it. You just don't realize it. You've accounted for it in determining that g is radial and is a function of r. But Gauss's law, or Gauss's theorem, really, only cares about the enclosed mass. 
in your Gaussian cylinder. It does not matter what's outside. We do not pay attention to what's outside. We just account for the mass in our red cylinder here. Now, that's easy to do. Rho is mass per volume. If I multiply rho, which is constant, by the volume of this red cylinder, I get the enclosed mass. So that would be rho. So let's write this out. It's minus 4 pi g rho to be multiplied by the volume of the red cylinder. That is area of base, which has a radius little r, times height l. And by Gauss's theorem, these two quantities are equal. So I can write that minus g of r times 2 pi rl is equal to minus 4 pi g rho pi r squared l. All right, minus signs cancel. Um, l cancels, as we expect, because it's an infinite cylinder of mass. One of the pi's cancels here, one of the r's cancels here, and 4 cancels with 2, leaving me with, ultimately, g of r is equal to 2 pi g rho r. And what I'm going to do is call this g1, just out of habit. This is g in region 1, and so it's given by 2 pi g rho times r. Fair enough. Same philosophy as the infinite line of mass, just applying it to a cylinder. And because a cylinder has an inside and an outside, we do the two regions separately. So we did region 1, we did the inside, now we're going to move to the outside of the cylinder. And we're going to repeat all of this just with a Gaussian cylinder that lives in region 2. So we are going to increase little r to be greater than big R, and repeat this entire reasoning. So let's do that right here. And let's draw out our cylinder. And don't worry too much. It's gonna, it is going to be a little faster in this case because a lot of what we've already done, you can reuse. So you got to be careful, but there are parts that you can reuse without changing anything. So here's our Gaussian cylinder, has a radius, little r. If you look at it from above, you would see this, sort of. Let me center that. That's better. Radius, little r. So this is, just for clarity and consistency, it's region 2 with little r greater than big r. Now, the reason you have to do two regions is actually because you are getting g on the surface of your Gaussian cylinder. And so if you want g in region 2, the surface of your Gaussian cylinder has to live in region 2 versus living in region 1, which is what we just did. So real quick, again, for consistency, we have dA1, dA2, and dA3. And, of course, for the exact same reasons, we only have flux through A2, through the cylindrical wall, not through the top or the bottom of the cylinder. So, essentially, we're going to write, well, we'd be drawing the same thing, and we'd actually be writing the exact same thing, because there is no way for flux to tell whether you're computing it in region 1 or region 2. The only thing flux knows is that you're computing it through a cylinder, but it doesn't know if it's in region 1 or region 2. So, certainly this is dA2. And again, 180 between G and dA2. All of that is true. G is constant on the cylindrical wall because all the points of that wall are the same distance from the center of the cylinder of mass. So we find ourselves in the exact same scenario in terms of flux. There's no difference. In fact, because there is no difference, you can literally do this. You can duplicate this and bring it down here, and there's your flux. Now, 
I know you hate when I do this because I'm kind of cheating. I get to I get to do that really quickly. Uh, I'm not doing it to be lazy, it turns out. I'm doing it to make a point. The point is that, again, Flux doesn't know if you're computing it in Region 1 or Region 2. So you should not be surprised when you do these types of problems that the Flux part does not change from one region to the other. What does change is the amount of mass that you enclose because now you have a bigger cylinder. So you have to account for the enclosed mass properly. But mathematically, there's no reason for this to be any different. So that being said, let's compute 4 pi g times mass enclosed. That is minus 4 pi g, and let's account for the mass that lives in my Gaussian cylinder. Now here's where you have to be careful. There's a subtle difference between region 1 and region 2. Here if you take the volume of your Gaussian cylinder, you're overcounting. You're overestimating the amount of mass because you're counting this dead volume here between your Gaussian cylinder and the actual mass. That volume does not contain any mass. So yes, all of, the, all of this piece of the infinite cylinder is contained in your Gaussian cylinder, but the mass itself does not live outside of the cylinder of mass. So all the mass that you must account for is right here, which means that we are going to take rho, which is mass per volume, but we are going to multiply it not by the volume of your Gaussian cylinder, but by the blue volume of the actual cylinder of mass. So that's the difference. The only difference is that here you're going to have rho pi big R squared times L instead of little r squared. So that's something to keep in mind. Hold on. There we go. Now you can see it. So here, let me, let me just redo that so you have the whole thing. If you want the mass enclosed, it's going to be rho times the volume but of the blue cylinder. So that's why you're going to use pi big R squared instead of little r squared times L. Little r squared would give you the volume of your Gaussian cylinder. That's too much volume. Not all of that volume contains mass, if you will. So we have flux. We have the right-hand side of Gauss's theorem. By Gauss's theorem, we set the two equal. And we're going to find that g in region 2, of course, is different. So minus g of r, 2 pi rl is equal to minus 4 pi g rho pi r squared l. L cancels as expected because it's an infinite cylinder of mass. Pi goes away, the negative signs go away, and then 4 divided by 2, that's going to clean up as well. And so the magnitude of this thing is going to be 2 pi g rho r squared divided by little r. And rather than just call that g of r, I'm going to go ahead and call it g2 of r. That's g in region 2. And of course, that's only magnitude. So if you wanted direction, if you want the actual vector g2, you would say, well, that's radially inward, so it's along minus r hat. So it's 2 pi g rho r squared over little r, and then minus r hat for direction. So that's your vector if what you're trying to figure out is the vector itself, not just the magnitude. All right. So one last thing. Let's compare G1 and G2, because they're not the same, if you remember. G1 looked like this. Actually, by, by the way, let me, let me do this in case you wanted the vector. Just add minus r hat. That's your direction. It's a radially inward gravitational field. There we go. All right, cool. So G1 does not look like G2. Quick comment on G1. G1 is actually proportional to little r, which is the radius of your Gaussian cylinder. That makes sense. If you make this Gaussian cylinder bigger, not so big that it enters region 2, just bigger within region 1, you enclose more mass. Mass creates gravitational field. So that means G goes up in magnitude. Therefore, we have G 
directly proportional to the radius r of our Gaussian cylinder. However, in region 2, it's no longer the case. It's actually the case that you get a constant value here divided by r. So now g2 decreases just like 1 over r. Why is that? Well, that's because in region 2, whatever you make little r, you've enclosed already all the mass you're going to enclose. You can enclose more mass by making r bigger or smaller as long as the cylinder is in region 2. So the amount of mass is fixed. Now, as you make r bigger, you move further away from the mass that creates the gravitational field, and thus you would expect to feel it less, and that is why your gravitational field decreases just like 1 over r. So, Gauss's theorem, again, a lot of similarities between the infinite line of mass and the infinite cylinder of mass. The main difference is that the cylinder has two regions, region 1 and region 2, and the philosophy, of course, overall of Gauss's theorem is the same in each region. You just have to be careful when it comes to the enclosed mass that you're computing, in this case, the right volume, to account for the mass that lives, that truly lives, in your Gaussian cylinder. And remember that it's only the enclosed mass that matters. Anything outside of your Gaussian cylinder, you've already accounted for. Even though it doesn't look like it, it doesn't matter to derive little g. Thanks for watching this video. If you haven't heard of Cogverse Academy before, we're a tutoring company that specializes in creating course companions that help you save time and improve your grades. You tell us which class you're taking, and we'll have a look at your syllabus, old exams, the style of your instructor, and put together a course companion, mapping over lecture notes, videos, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions, even personalized study guides and access to a private chat for you to ask all your questions. If this sounds like something that might be helpful to you, feel free to check us out at congressacademy.com.